Hi guys, it's Chris, back in the cider shed with some more cider to try. But uh, there isn't more cider to try, because I haven't got any cider today. I'm doing something different. So the last video I tried Parmigiano Reggiano with uh, the Yellington milk from Ross and White. I said in the next film I'm going to try this Parmigiano Reggiano with some of the Aurora Perry, 2018 from Butford Organic. But I drank it, so I can't do that. But I thought I'd indulge myself. So we're going to have some cheese again. It's not Parmigiano Reggiano. So today I was at Mons doing a photo shoot of cheese and beer and wine and cider for their website. And so, yeah, at the end of the shoot, there's some things that I had to look around in the shop for things I hadn't had for a while or hadn't had before. and found two things, one of which I have had before and one of which I've never had before. OK, and it's a beer. So we're going to do a beer. Um, anyone who's watched a few of these, uh, these videos will know that I've got a long term sort of experience in cheese, but also spent quite a few years working in beer as well uh, before I got into cider. So I also have passions for those things as well. So I'm going to indulge those passions. Join me if you want. You don't have to. But I'm going to do it nonetheless. All right. So what's the beer? The beer is this guy. So what's it called again? Braybrook Keller beer made at uh, Braybrook Farm in Leicestershire. Quite an interesting brewery. Don't know loads about them, but I do know that they only make lagers, which is very unusual. And lagers, for those who don't know, are more complicated to make. They take longer to make than uh, beers because you have to age them slowly at cool, cool temperatures, cold temperatures, in fact, I would say, you know. Uh, and it takes a lot longer because it's colder. So the, uh, the organic processes take longer and they're slower. Uh, and they're called bottom fermented because at cold temperatures, the yeast settle to the bottom. And actually, that's why they, and they drop bright as well, actually, generally. So, yeah, so generally speaking, um, bottom fermented. There's some debate about bottom fermenting and yeast. Uh, but anyway, uh, cold fermentation, cold storage, lagering, which means to store in Germany. That's kind of what it means because they, they store them for a long time uh, to produce lagers. Now, what's interesting about Keller beer is Keller beer is one of my favourite styles of lager, which is why I picked this bottle up. And uh, Keller is German, from, traditionally from like Franconian region of Germany. Um, and one of my favourite beers is a Keller beer. It's called, uh, Mar it's by Mars Brau, Mar Mars Brewery. Uh, Ungespundet is their Keller beer. It's the first Keller beer I think I ever had. And really, it set the benchmark very high indeed. I love it. I love it. And, and actually, whilst in, uh, sort of looking up these guys, I found out that these guys travelled around Germany, which is how they got into lager, and actually met a guy called Stefan, who's the head brewer at Mars Brau. And he introduced them to Keller beer, Ungespunde, the beer that was my favourite. And that's one of the things that inspired them to become brewers. So this is actually, the, this beer that they make was kind of like the, the first thing they ever did. It was kind of like based on their inspiration for brewing lagers in the first place, which is all very interesting. But it's got, uh, uh, it's got, a, it's got, the, it's got some, uh, you know, Big, big shoes to fill, big boots to fill, basically, as far as I'm concerned. But let's see if it can do it. But um, let's look at the cheese first. So what's the cheese? Well, it's a kefili. And anybody who watches this will know that I eat a lot of kefili because I managed Borough Market stand for Tritown Brothers who make unpasteurised handmade kefili and they make uh, unpasteurised cloth-bound cheddar called Pitchfork. But this is not the Goeth kefili. This is Duckett's kefili. And there it is. And what a beautiful looking thing that is. Look at a gorgeous natural rind on that. You know, nice ivory colour there. Cow's milk. So nice ivory colour. It's a natural rind. I don't know all that. It looks youthful, this, I have to say. So Duckett's Kefili, originally made by Chris Duckett, which I think was the first cheesemaker I ever visited. Ever. And when I went there, his mother was out the back, hand patting butter that we used to sell in the shop at Neil's Yard Dairy as well when I worked there. And uh, I totally transformed my notion of butter and cheese it was it was just it was literally a light bulb moment i'll never forget it and todd trithowen who makes go with kefili went and lived i think in a caravan on chris duckett's farm for six months to learn how to make kefili from him so this was the only unpasteurized kind of natural rind had made kefili in the world until todd started making go with kefili after chris duckett passed away it was taken over by a guy um called tom tom calver and his dad who make Westcombe cheddar. So they make this, che this cheese, this Duckett's Kefili, on their farm now in Somerset. Uh, they have a vat basically in the same room as their cheddar vat, and they make them side by side. Quite different makes, but they make them side by side. So they're both made in Westcombe, 
by Tom, uh, Tom Calver and his dad. So, there you go. And I think they've done a really good job because it's maintained a lot of its character. It's great. Um, and also the, the rind smells great. Freshly tilled earth is what it smells like. It's fantastic. So, let's go back to this beer. Uh, anything on the bottle that we want to read about? Uh, but, 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 uh, well, actually, let's talk about Keller beer. So, Ungespunden, I said. That means unbung. So, basically, they were aged in wooden, uh, uh, unpressurised wooden vessels. In, uh, uh, wooden vessels. It's unpasteurised and unfiltered. Okay, which makes it very different to a lot of uh, a lot of uh, lagers. You know, it can have a little bit more cloud to it. Uh, it's not it's not pasteurized. I mean, it tends to drop bright, so it is relatively bright. To be honest with you, it's not hazy like a like an IPA or something like that would be hazy. Um, but yeah, uh, it gives it a completely different flavour, I think. And they're not too fizzy. They're quite rich, malty, delicious things. Delicious things. Um, yeah, to have a look. Ingredients. Water, barley, malt, hops, and yeast brewed in the corners with the Reinheitsgebot 1516. So, the Reinheitsgebot, the German purity law, I didn't know that, I, did, I just noticed that, I didn't know that was on the bottle. The German purity law basically stated that um, to stop people just making any old thing, basically, it's one of the very first sort of, you know, um, like an AOC for like controls, like, um, uh, like a PDO, AOC protection, if you like, stated that you could only make beer from hops, water and barley. That was it, those three things. But there's something missing off there, isn't there? Yeast. And the reason why they didn't put yeast on the list, because they didn't know it existed then. They didn't know yeast existed. They didn't know about this single-celled organism that turned uh, sugar into alcohol. That didn't happen until the 19th century and Louis Pasteur got involved. So that's why it's right height to but it's also got malt on it now, okay? Um, yeast on the label now. Wouldn't have had that in 1516. Uh, probably wouldn't have had a label either. But there you go, right. Jesus Christ. And I've talked a lot. Let's open it. Nice. So there you go. Gentle, gentle, very gentle carbonation. I assume this is force carbonated. I assume it's force carbonated. Let's pour it out. I expect this to be darker than, say, a Pilsner by some margin. They use Munich malt in this. Yeah, which is nice golden malt. You get sort of like a bready honeyed character, I find, from those malts. Look at that. Look at that head. That is a fantastic head. It is beautiful. It's beautiful, almost like Mr. Whippy ice cream. That, and who doesn't love Mr. Whippy ice cream? I love Mr. Whippy ice cream. So yeah, look at that gorgeous head. I mean, that is a gorgeous looking thing on the eye. Um, let's try and give it a sniff. I'm going to struggle trying to sniff it through this one. I might have a drink before I can smell it. Oh no, there you go. Oh, I'm getting there. Nope. Yeah, so malty, bready, like freshly baked bread, that yeasty kind of character. There's a sweetness to it as well. And you always get that kind of like sort of spicy hop, European hop, which they'll be using European hops, not New World hops, which are more grassy and kind of spicy and sort of minerally, I think, in character. None of that citrus sort of character or piney character you get with New World hops. Yeah, it smells great, actually. Delicate. My mouth's watering. It smells like delicious bread, and I love bread. Nice. Let's give it a go. good it's pretty good now forget your you know your hop centric crazy eight percent beers you know which i like i mean maybe not eight percent but i love ipas and pale ales and you know those new world hop characters but there's a lot to be said for beer like this a lot to be said for beer like this. so this is really quite dry there's that kind of mineral sort of spicy green character coming from the hops uh, not super bitter but it doesn't need to be because it's not super alcoholic it's not super sweet and the hops are there to balance the sweetness Okay, so it's not quite as sweet. You don't need a rich. You don't need as many hops to, to balance it out, basically. But there's a nice hot bitterness on the back end there, but very gentle. But it has got that kind of yeah, yeah, European green sort of like spicy character. Um, then you get that lovely kind of like sweet. It's almost like honeyed bread character. I want to say, which I love. I love, and the texture in the mouth is awesome. Yeah. Solid, solid. I'd love to have this next to the Mars to see how it compares. Because apparently Stefan, the guy from Mars, helped them get started. So basically, I mean, did he give them his recipe? I don't know. It seems a strange thing to do, but maybe he did. Maybe he did. But this is up there. This is quality. 
Mm. Rich, delicious, lovely, lovely sort of honeyed, bready character. Then that kind of lovely spicy bitterness on the back end, cutting, like bouncing out brilliantly, brilliantly. It's very hard to make something subtle this delicious. It really is. What's the, uh, what is the ABV on this? It is four point. What is that? So it's very small. The print four point nine percent, four point eight percent. I think it's four point eight percent. Four point eight percent. Gotta love it. I could drink that all day. Could drink it all day. Super. Right. Pour some more out. Flipping heck. I'm gonna have to get some more of this. Really like it. Really like it. Right. So let's check out the cheese now. I picked this beer with this cheese because actually there is a lot of British real ale character in this, you know, European hops, that, that sweet maltiness you get, not too strong. Um, the difference between this and like a Caskill would be the carbonation, you know, the Caskills going to be much stiller than this. Um, but unpasteurised, unfiltered, etc. Ticks all those boxes. So it's very like a British uh, beer in many ways, I think, uh, you know, and like um, Britain and... Uh, Germany and Belgium, really the three pow the three powerhouse brewing wo uh, countries in the world, before America sort of tried to take that man wrest that mantle from them. I kind of kind of succeeded in many ways, I think. Um, you know, and so there's a lot of crossover, and I think this style reminds me very much of really good British beers, except for the carbonation and maybe a little bit spicy, but yeah, rocking. And this is a very traditional British cheese, so I thought something that tastes kind of British has some British character. With a British territorial, it's called a territorial because it's named after a place, a territory. Caerphilly was a place in Wales. You know, Cheddar, a place in Somerset, that's another territorial. Wensdale, that's another territorial, that's a place in Yorkshire. Okay, so this is a territorial. So, so traditional British cheese is quite acid, so quite crumbly because uh, they lose some uh, calcium to the whey as they're made because of their acidity. Quite technical, it won't go into it. So you get these crumbly textures. But also this is kind of like buttery and springy as well. So it's obviously a little bit of friability to it. You can see that. You can see like the, it kind of looks snappable. Also enough moisture to make it kind of springy and delicious. So yeah, it's, it's a bit bright. What, but so, sorry about that. Anyway, I'm going to have some of this. I haven't had any of this for ages. Ages. And Tom actually uh, texted me and said I should go and visit him next time in Somerset. Which I'm going to try and do, but I've had a few invitations to visit people in Somerset. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to visit them all yet. But I think this is going to be brilliant. Right, cheese. Yeah. Buttery. Oh, man. Super buttery on the nose. And then on the round, really freshly tilled earth. Like, smack front and centre. It's fantastic. What a great combination. Mm. Youthful. So, still quite acid. But it's lovely lactic acidity. And there's a definite hint of butter. And kind of minerality, that kind of fresh tilled soil minerality comes from the palate as well. Great sort of cheeses. I mean, these sorts of British territorials are very much sniffed at by a lot of people. But Jesus Christ. Funny, if you put them on a cheese board with loads of fancy cheeses, at the end of the meal, if you look at the cheese board, usually they're the ones that have mainly been entirely devoured. Because they're, they're easy. But that doesn't mean that they're kind of in any way, that's no way dismissive, you know. They're utilitarian, designed to be eaten, you know. Um, Kofili was designed to be eaten in mines by miners, you know, to give them energy and salt because they sweated a lot. Um, but by God, when they're done well, they are fantastic. I've got this kind of sheen of like buttery creaminess left in my palate now. And some lingering acidity. And then that, that mushroomy, earthy, freshly tilled soil character as well in there. Absolutely fab. Look at some of this. Man, this is top. If this is top. I mean, if I went to an English pub and got served something like this, I'd be very happy indeed. Very happy indeed. Mm. That, my friends. It's a really good combination. I had a moment then. It's a really good combination. That and that are a brilliant combination. Just, just brilliant bedfellows. Brilliant bedfellows. The acidity in this and the, and the minimal salting. The salt there, but it's it's totally integrated. It's no way salty, but it's there. And the kind of sweet breadiness of this. I mean, cheese and bread. 
I mean, what's not to love? You know, that spicy minerality of the hops with the minerality of this. What's not to love? It's effing great. Effing great. Well, I'm in for a good evening. So that was a long one. 15 minutes. I do apologise, but I think they deserved 15 minutes. Okay, I will be back uh, with some cider, you know, because uh, that's, that's what we do. Um, so if you tuned in expecting cider, sorry, but not sorry at all, because that is fantastic. Okay, guys, as per usual, I will be back very soon, but thank you for joining me for this video, and until then, cheers. <laughs>